World class, world class, world class. My fascination for those two words spans two decades and goes back to when I was a 13-year-old boy. I was really keen to get my first part-time job. So one Saturday morning, I walked down to some of the local businesses in the village that I grew up in. And the first door that I happened to knock on was the local pub. Two beaming smiles greeted me, Jerry and Anne. I said, my name's David, I'm 13 and I'm looking for a job. They said, you better come in. Now, quite clearly, there was only one job I could do in such an establishment at that age, and that was wash the dishes. Big dishes, small dishes, knives, spoons, forks, the lot. That would be my responsibility for one or two shifts a week. And I absolutely loved that job. Very early on, I realised that I was in a booming enterprise. The bar was always filled and the restaurant was always packed. And I remember asking Jerry one day, why is your pub so successful? And he said, David, let me show you. He took me out to the front of the pub, sat me down on a bar stool and said, watch this. He then proceeded to pour two drinks. The first was an absolutely perfect pint. The second, he spilt a little bit. He said, David, what's the difference? I said, Jerry, you spilled a little bit of beer on that second pint. He said, no, I haven't, David. I've just spilled 50 pence. You see, in the food and drink industry, you have to value your assets, if it's fluid behind the bar or food in the kitchen. If we were a news agent, we wouldn't open our doors and chuck out Mars bars, so why would we waste our asset? You see, David, that is a marginal gain. I teach my staff to pull the perfect pint, and that gives us a little bit of an edge over the competition. We do not waste any money. And then he smiled and said, I would love us to be a world-class pub. And when he muttered those words, I've then spent the next 20 years of my life watching and listening to how successful people operate. Over the last seven years, I've had the great privilege of leading my own organization, Seven Billion Ideas. We exist to connect the seven billion people on the planet with their own ideas and their own imaginations. And we do it in two different ways, in the education and in the corporate space. And since becoming a leader, I've learned a huge amount, but three lessons spring to mind. The first, lots of small things completed well add up and have a profound impact. These are called marginal gains. Number two, innovation can come at any time from any place and from anyone. And as a leader, it's your responsibility to create a fearless environment where people can share the everyday idea. And lastly, the biggest asset that a leader can bring to, a, to their own organization is a positive, world-class mentality. Your mentality as a leader not only helps define the culture and the values of an organization, but the pace, the tone, and the quality of your work. And at 7 Billion Ideas, we aspire to be world-class in everything that we do. So today, I'm going to be talking about what is a world-class mentality, why is it essential that we adopt it, and how we can all start now. So what is a world-class mentality? You don't have to look far into the world of sport to find individuals or teams which embody those two words, world-class. It might be Ennis, Williams, Holmes, it might be Coley, Messi, Ronaldo, Pele, Muhammad Ali. The list could go on and on and on. And when we watch these athletes, the commentators quickly say those words as well. It might be a world-class pass. It might be a world-class shot. It might even be a world-class celebration. But the reason these individuals and these superstars are world-class is not actually because what they do on the sporting field of play it's what they do off it. It's what they do when nobody is watching. They are constantly trying to find ways to improve their day. How they start, how they excel in the middle when they're training, and even how they are resting. They are constantly looking for marginal gains. And you don't have to go far into the world of sport or onto the internet to find some great examples of marginal gains in sport. But I thought I'd share one which I love which is about the eye coach which helped win the 2003 World Cup for England. Clive Woodward was absolutely fascinated with this topic around marginal gains and embracing a world-class mentality. 
And he did a huge amount, but one thing he did was employ Dr. Cheryl Calder, the eye coach, to help improve the vision of his players on the field. He believed if they improved their vision, their kicking, their passing, their tackling, and ultimately their vision across the field of play would significantly improve and help them on the pitch. And it did. It was one of the many, many reasons they won the World Cup back in 2003. But what a lot of people don't know about this lady is she went and did it again. She was South African, her next employer was the South African rugby team, and in 2007, they won the World Cup as well. And Brian Habana has claimed that she has helped him with his own reaction time, changing it from 0.56 seconds down to 0.18 seconds on the field of play, which is a huge amount of time in elite sport. But if I had to help everybody in this room really visualise what a world-class mentality really looks like, I would draw this line, and I call this the everlasting line. This line reflects a mindset of wanting to continually improve in absolutely everything you do, no matter who you are or what you do. The reason I call it the everlasting line is because we should all be constantly, consciously and relentlessly trying to improve. You see, that yellow line is also made up of hundreds and thousands of small marginal gains. Marginal gains that we can all implement on a day-to-day -day basis. To me, this is what a world-class mentality is. Now, some people in the room might say, David, that is fantastic. Thank you very much for enlightening me, but I don't actually have time to go and implement all of those changes. I'm too busy. My response to that is, I am brilliantly busy. I am brilliantly busy doing what I love day in, day out, but time is no longer an excuse. Time is the only common currency across the seven billion people across the planet. We have to find time, we have to make time, we have to prioritise the changes. Some people in the room might go, David, that is fantastic, you've given me the answer. I'm going to go make 100 improvements this year, and will I be world class at the end of the year? Maybe. Maybe not. James Clear, the New York Times best-selling author, believes that if you take a particular activity and you improve by 1% every day and you compound it by 365 times in a year, you will be 37 times better off at the end of the year. So you certainly would have started to embrace the right mentality. So what is a world-class mentality? A mindset of wanting to continually improve in absolutely everything you do no matter who you are or what you do. But why is it so essential that we adopt it? In my opinion, a world-class person delivers. A world-class person creates. A world-class person cares, they invent, and they push boundaries day in, day out. But so what? I believe we can learn a lot from the world of sport and that world-class mentality in our businesses, in our schools, and as well, at home, as well as at home. But let's start with business. Over the last 10 years, we've seen the collapse of some major businesses here in the UK and around the world. But I can't help but think to myself, in those last few years, did those businesses embrace a world-class mentality? Were they doing the same thing and getting the same results? Were they inventing, delivering, exceeding expectations, pushing boundaries, and did everybody, and I must stress, did everybody care? Maybe, maybe not. But we can all fall into that trap in our working week of doing the same thing day in, day out, with very little improvement. And let me give you an example of something. Conference calls. Conference calls, conference calls, conference calls. Some people smirking in the room. These are part and parcels of lots of people's weeks. What you might not know is that last year, it was uh, predicted that roughly 163 billion minutes were spent on conference calls in the UK and the US. Roughly 15 minutes of every conference call is spent just getting started or dealing with distractions. And 25%, and I won't ask the audience, but 25% have admitted to doing a conference call in the last year or hosting a conference call on the toilet. <laughs> Not necessarily a world-class way of working. I'm sure if we all look at our working week, there are improvements that we can make. But it's not just our businesses. 
I've had the great privilege of working in education over the last seven years and seen some wonderful innovation day in, day out in lots of schools, but we can do more in our schools. But also at home, this is my beautiful family, Jenny, Toby and Harry. And we know personally we can do more at home to have a smarter house. Can we reduce our food wastage, travel a little bit less? The answer is yes, yes, yes. It is absolutely essential that we adopt this mentality to help our businesses survive, to help our schools to become hubs of innovation, and for our homes to become even smarter. So how can we start today, and how can we start now? Well, I'm going to be talking from two perspectives. Firstly, if you're a leader or a manager of a team, and secondly, what we can all do as individuals. If you're a leader, and that privileged uh, responsibility of being a leader or a manager, there's two things that you have to do. Firstly, you have to train your teams about what you mean about mentality and what you want them to adopt. The second thing that you have to do is give them the framework to share, to collaborate and develop on all types of ideas, small and big. However, in my experience, when it comes to this part of trying to embrace a world-class mentality, lots of organisations do these three things when they're trying to gather ideas to really improve. The first thing that they might do is implement a suggestion box scheme and say, I'm a leader, we're embracing a world-class mentality, please put your ideas into that suggestion box. But most suggestion boxes just collect dust. The second thing that they might do is say, look, there's an open door over there, please come through that door. If you've got an idea, 24-7, I want to hear it. But it takes a huge amount of courage to walk through that door and also great timing. And lastly, they might implement a little bit of their time in team meetings or in training sessions for ideation and ideas to be shared. But these ideas are never, ever recorded or really acted on. And what happens when an idea is not written down upon creation is the Ebbinghaus curve impact kicks in, where it's simply forgotten over time. And this is actually accelerated today because we're all brilliantly busy. So it's so important as leaders that we train our workforce around this mentality and also give them the framework to share these ideas. We have to allow ideas to collide and explode in our organisations. We need to talk the talk as leaders, walk the walk, and highlight the importance of marginal gains day in, day out. No idea is too small to be heard. But it also makes good business sense. From my experience, Ideas coming from the grassroots and from bottom up help to do five things. Firstly, save money, make money, improve productivity, improve client, and indeed employee satisfaction. And let me give you a perfect example. We were recently working with an organization out in Asia, a very hot environment, where the leader was determined to be the best in the business. And on day one of their mentality transformation program, an idea came forward from a back-to-work breastfeeding mother. And she said, in this hot and sticky environment, please can we have a mother's room? I'm going three to four times into the toilet to pump milk. The idea was shared. Six other women came forward, which represented 2% of their working population. The leader listened, acted on, and immediately found a place in their environment to have a mother's room. And everybody felt more empowered. It makes fantastic business sense as well to adopt this mentality. But what can we all do as individuals? Well, this will be different from person to person. But one very simple thing that I'm going to give you this afternoon is a commitment to 12. It's January, it's that time of year. Let's forget about New Year's resolutions, but let's commit to ourselves to do 12 improvements over the next year that could make a difference. And you're not allowed to laugh. These are some of my suggestions from last year. Mine are based around trying to find time in my week. Okay, find time in my week so I can spend more time with my family. But let me pick on a few. I wanted to improve the way that I was communicating with my team. I'm dyslexic, so it takes me ages to write emails. So I now start and finish my week with a very quick video message. Secondly, I wanted to reduce the amount of time I was spending on email. So to members of my team and some of our clients, I started sending voice notes. And even if that saves me 10 minutes a day, and it's roughly 250 working days a year, that's two and a half thousand minutes, that is five working days back of my time. And I'll pick on number three there. I'm terrible. I buy a coffee every single day, or I used to. And I predicted to myself, if I was standing in that coffee queue for two minutes, 
250 times a year, that was 500 minutes a year, I was standing to wait to buy coffees, that's one working day a year, I'm literally standing in the queue. So I bought a coffee machine at home. <laughs> Guys, it's so important that leaders, you need to embrace this mentality and create training programs in your organizations. And also have a structured approach around ideation. But at home, it's time to create our list. And I hope the big takeaway is that everybody today can go away and create their world-class list. World-class. I've had a fascination for those two words for the last two decades. Imagine a world where everybody embraced a world-class mentality. Imagine how productive our businesses would be, how innovative our schools would be, and how smart our homes would be. But also imagine a world if we don't embrace this mentality. Will history look back at us as the generation which didn't make as much advancement as we possibly could? I started off by talking about how Jerry told me the important lesson around how his pub was so successful. And one thing he did was to teach his staff around how to pull the perfect pint. A pint now might cost us five pounds, but having a world-class mentality costs us nothing. Thank you.